Hi. Good morning. Well, I have some good news and some better news. First of all, I'm really happy to be here today, just two days after the National Day. Happy National Day, everyone. And the better news is that there are so many spotlights on me that I can't see any of you right now, so there's no need to be nervous. And I can share with you the story I came to tell you today. A year ago today, I was busy planning and preparing for an expedition to the North Pole, a place I had always dreamed of visiting, one of the remotest locations on this Earth. I thought it was magical in some way, and I wanted to go there and see for myself what it was like. In my head, the picture that came to mind was of a stick person standing on top of the globe that NASA might catch some satellite shots of, which, of course, I'd be posting on Facebook if I could get my hands on them. Right from the beginning, I knew that training for the expedition would be really tough. I also wasn't entirely sure how I'd survive up to 11 days of skiing in temperatures of up to minus 30 degrees Celsius for eight to 10 hours a day, carrying all my own supplies and sleeping in a tent. But I knew I had to try my best. And as I tried to figure out how I would prepare for such a huge task, a task that seemed almost but not impossible to me, I thought about the many young people who might benefit from sharing this story. I thought about the rates of child obesity and diabetes that were increasing in the UAE. And the truth was, I didn't think there were a whole lot of young people who'd even be interested in sharing this journey. But if I reached just 1% of young people, it was worth it to me. So at that time, I naively said, OK, I'll create a homemade blog, and maybe 100 people might visit it. And I was quite satisfied with that. So as my personal resolve grew into certainty, I reached out to friends and family in search of advice and support. Well, my friends thought I was flat out crazy. And my family, well, we got there. But more importantly, somewhere along the way, it was pointed out to me that there are many young women in the UAE who need an example of an absolutely normal person just like them from the same community, subject to the same rules, but different in one way. Someone who is carving her own path simply because that's what's required to achieve a perfectly legitimate personal dream. Now, when I was a young person, I really loved sport. However, there were no role models for me of UAE national women that made it OK to be athletic and competitive. And this was a reality that when I thought about it, I was not prepared to perpetuate into the future. So the cause hit close to home. Suddenly, I found myself, therefore, facing a huge media plan with lots of interviews, a loss of privacy, and lots of public speaking. And the truth was, none of this even sounded like me. I had spent six years building and reinforcing my privacy. Because for me, privacy meant peace. And reaching out to those women, just like me, meant giving up that hard-earned peace. Well, it was around this time that I was waiting for feedback from the first sponsor I had approached to support my expedition. The, the team there were really in love with the story. They wanted to support it exclusively. But when they submitted the sponsorship proposal to their senior director for approval, he hesitated. And in time, he refused to accept. You see, the trouble was the title of the sponsorship proposal. It read, The First Arab Female and UAE National Ground Expedition to the North Pole. And the trouble in there were the words, First UAE National. In his mind, when he thought about it, he said, If there's no UAE National male who's headed, headed off to the North Pole, why am I sending the first UAE National female? In his view, this simply was not the way things were meant to unfold. It wasn't the order of things. So it's ironic to be standing here exactly one year to the day from when I received that first refusal, because that was then. And what a different world it turned out to be than his perception. And how much would have been lost had I allowed his perception to be imposed on, onto me. Much has changed in the past 13 months. Instead of him, I gained sponsors and a sport team who fell in love with the story, who had vision and weren't afraid to invest in local youth. And in our common vision, we both saw change, and the most beautiful type of change, change that is un unorchestrated, implicit, and free to take on a life magnitude 
and direction of its own. Much of this and the rest of my story has been covered by media over and again. Details of the cold extremes that I'd be exposed to, of the hour upon hour of physical training that I would be doing every day, and even all the physical hardships I would be seeing while I was out there, all that story was told while I was, while I was um, preparing. By the way, funny story. One of the most common questions I got, both from media and the public at the time, was where did you go to the bathroom? And I, I, you know, I don't get what this fascination, fascination is with such a messy topic. And you know, the question was actually more specific than I'm actually going to say on a TED, TED stage. But anyway, I'm not here to talk about any of those details today. Because while the media was focusing on the physical challenge at hand, I watched and witnessed the most beautiful series of events unfold, more, more long-lasting and more powerful than the grains of sand from my desert that I scattered at the top of the world. And this part, <laughs> and this part of the story was lost to the public until today, and it was magical. Over the course of four months, women in the UAE and in time the region, and then even the world, came to read or hear about the story. And as they started to form views, I received an influx of letters in my inbox almost overnight. And many people asked me what inspired me while I was preparing for the expedition. It's these stories that inspired me, and I'd like to share with you a few of them today. Some of the stories told tales of mothers with big hearts and big dreams. Women who had put their dreams aside or put it on a back burner as is commonly the case for people who make daily sacrifices for the people they love. Dear Elham, I'm a Lebanese woman and mother living in Dubai. I just want to tell you how proud I was today to see your pictures and read about your success in the newspaper. I showed the article to my 15-year-old son, and I will forward it to your link to my daughter and son who live in Canada, and to all my friends in Canada, the Middle East, and other countries. I train very hard every day, and I hope one day I will be able to go for something that I'm very passionate about, maybe a marathon or a mountain climb. And then I gave a speech at Dubai Women's College. And I was actually really nervous that day. And the reason was I knew the women at Dubai Women's College were probably some of the hardest to impact. Many came from the strictest households. Some were the first generation of women to be educated in their families. On that day, my fingers were still numb with frost nip from the physical extremes I had returned from. And yet, to me, they were a challenge in their own right, and probably the challenge that counted more. Dear Elham, I have today attended your speech at Dubai Women's College. It was great listening to your experience and achievements. I'm wondering if you have future expeditions. I would be glad to take part if you're looking for a team of Emirati ladies. Dear Elham, I poured over every detail of your website. I wanted to know how you survived in that environment, where you slept, where you went to the bathroom, what you wore, was it fun, and did you suffer? Because when I learned of your trip, I knew I had to do that too. It would be a dream come true. By the way, there's that bathroom question coming up again. And then the story took an even more interesting turn. Actually, before that, I should mention. Now, we Emiratis were, or at least as women, we're not necessarily the most athletic people. We're creatures of comfort, so much so that I thought I'd forever be labeled as that woman who pulled a range over across Jumeirah Beach. <laughs> and you know, who knows, maybe I still am. So I really didn't expect to see this much athletic interest in response to my first action. And then the story took a more interesting turn. I started to receive letters from men, but men who were even more ambitious for their fellow Arab women's progress than many of the women themselves. From the depths of Yemen, I received the following letter as one man reflected on some challenges his, the women in his family faced. You are a bastion of hope, an example for all Arab women to identify with, especially those that remain shy despite their capabilities and believe glory is reserved for and made by men alone. Yet another from a UAE national, as they reflected on an important career decision his sister had to take about representing the UAE internationally. I must admit that as a UAE national, I was pleasantly surprised and find myself overcome by an extreme sense of pride when I heard your BBC segment. I sincerely believe that it's by heroic and selfless acts, such as your trip to the North Pole, 
that we will eventually break the traditional views of women's roles in our society that have constricted women's freedom and ability to contribute in all sectors. And yet another from a UAE national male in response to its skepticism from a UAE national female on my blog. How did she benefit herself and her country? I will tell you how. I have a two-year-old daughter that I know one day will ask me if I really believe she, she can accomplish anything she puts her heart and mind to. I know that I will tell her that female UAE nationals just like her, who were probably given similar opportunities, face similar disappointments, and given similar cultural baggage, if you will, achieved things that were so complex in nature and diverse as reaching the North Pole. She won't relate to those experiences that much had they only been achieved by people of the other gender, of other nationalities and backgrounds. My daughter needs this, because the most daring thing she will see me do will be flying a kite. It's great. But perhaps the most inspiring of all these stories that inspired me were those like the one I received from young Haya, talking of change in the remotest parts of the UAE. My name is Haya from Liwa Oasis. I have been watching you and follow your trip to the North Pole, and I'm so proud of you with your accomplishments. I see myself in you because I think I have that passion to do something big for my country. Also, I have the enthusiasm to make a change in women in the UAE. I think all what we need is a great example, a role model, I should say. You are my role model, and I'm going to make a change, inshallah. So I encountered an army of women who had the heart and who dared to dream. Women who struggle with fear in the face of adversity, just like you or me, but who are nevertheless steadfast. All of them have one thing in common. They come from a beautiful, tight-knit community. At the same time, they are not unique. They're multifaceted. Put simply, they're not homogenous. Certainly, for people like this, one of the most debilitating powers to overcome are those that we internalize, accept as a norm, and unknowingly impose on ourselves. By the way, some of these women whose stories I've shared with you today are sitting in the audience with you. It was four months over the course, well, two months, actually. I received thousands of letters. Of those 700 told tales of personal change. Stories of how hearing about the expedition awakened a latent energy within them. Stories of how they weren't exactly sure in what form, but they were now determined to make a change in a certain aspect of their reality. Because if one person skied to the North Pole, they too could face their cultural baggage in order to achieve their dreams. 700 emails in less than two months. And my inbox still reads over 1,800 unread messages that I'm working my way through. And I'm certain many more of those will tell tales of young people, women, UAE nationals, Arabs, whoever you may call it, with big hearts and big dreams. That was in the end. <laughs> I, I thought I was getting pushed off. I was like, can't be 19 minutes, but anyway. <laughs> with big hearts and big dreams. Um, so what do all these numbers imply? Well, to me, one thing resonated as a truth. In the face of adversity, it's easy to convince yourself that things, that realities the way we know them today are fairly constant, that the way that we perceive them today is the way they will always be. But isn't change actually the one thing we're guaranteed in life? Isn't it the one thing that happens every day? Both people and environments change. That's a certainty. It's actually the sinking of the two that is the uncertainty. And therefore, the real question to me is, do we, do we mold our macrocosms in line with our changing needs, or do we just accept it and say, whatever shall be, will be? And does it take one person to create lasting change, or do you need an entire movement of people? It's sometimes suggested that what I achieved was made possible by some fundamentally more liberal set of circumstances. I assure you, my parents in the audience probably laugh when they hear that. And probably any parent in the audience does. The truth is, it took a huge amount of change over a six month period. Not, nothing very short of death and rebirth. There is no free lunch. But it was, at the end, the greatest gift I had ever received. 
1955, Rosa Parks, an African-American woman, refused to give up her seat on the bus in line with the then prevailing racial segregation laws for a white man. Rosa looked around her, her environment and she knew she needed to live in a world where she had fair, equitable access to such a basic need as transportation. She also knew it would be difficult but not impossible to achieve that outcome. In fact, Rosa's actions on that day spiraled into a Supreme Court ruling that ended segregation on public transportation in the US. One person, one dream to ride the bus home in peace. One person, one dream to see the top of the world. One person, one dream to run a marathon after her children grew up. One person, one dream to change the way women in her remote community in the UAE perceived themselves. Like Rosa, we all continuously evaluate our paradigms in the, face, in the face of our new ambitions and our life paths. And why do we do so? It's not, well, actually, one headline read at the time that I was at the North Pole, Dubai woman breaks tradition and heads for the North Pole. Elham traded in her black abaya for a puffy parka in a quest to become the first Arab woman to reach the North Pole. Now that's a catchy headline, but the truth was I laughed because I didn't need to do any of that to accomplish my dream. You see, it's not emancipation. It's not liberation brought to us from far off lands that we need. It's organic, natural change. It's, it's not as though our dreams are inherently in contradiction with our culture. It's, it's natural change driven by passion. The stories that I've shared with you today, the impact and the change, it cannot be taught, created, manipulated, or imposed. And now that it's done, it's taken a life of its own, and we have yet to even see its full impact. As for me, my role in the story is done. It's up to those people who chose to react, respond, and engage to carry its true impact forward. And with all these dreams that are waiting to be fulfilled, and all this newfound willpower to go and pursue them. Dare to tell me that today is not our day. Thank you.